We have been studying the Sermon on the Mount this summer, and um, this is where we find ourselves this morning is to talk about prayer. Before we study about prayer, let's go to him. We come to you now, Lord. You have heard our confession. You have heard our sacrifice of praise. We have gathered together in your name and now we welcome you to the deepest part of our hearts. Lord, we wanna learn how to talk to you, how to be at ease in your presence. And so please, Lord, teach us now through your Holy Spirit. We pray for those around our country who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would give them clarity, that you would anoint them so that many would come to faith in you. I pray for our missionaries around the sea, around the world, Lord, across the seas and different places around the world that, that you would protect them and that you would anoint their efforts, whether they're preaching or whether they're serving whatever they're doing, Lord, that it would be anointed by your Holy Spirit. We pray for a revival to occur in our country, Lord. We pray that you would begin it in our church, that we'd be people who are far more interested in your faithful presence with us and our faithful presence in this community than we are anything else. Now, Lord, we pray for the one who teaches this morning, forgive him of his sins, for they are many. We've come here to see Jesus and him only. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Matthew 6, verse 5. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward, but whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you're praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, chapter seven, verse seven, please. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. If there's anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if a child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Prayer is a very vital part of what it means to be a human. I don't know if you know this, but they've actually surveyed atheists and asked them if they ever pray. (laughs) And atheists will say, occasionally, You think about that for a second. An atheist, every once in a while, says a prayer. And the reason they do that is because they want to know that there is something bigger out there than just my own ideas and my own sense of self. There's just something about the human condition that longs for something larger than us to help make sense and give order to a chaotic world. We want to touch transcendence. I don't know, uh, some of you may know this, that my wife and I have three sons and the oldest of those sons uh, has four grand gingers, as I call them. And um, two of those grand gingers are two little redheaded twin granddaughters. And when one of those granddaughters was four years old, she told me on more than one occasion that when she grows up, she wants to marry me. I told her I would wait for her. She is an adorable little girl named Addie. 
About three years ago, Lynette and I were at the Buena Vista Roastery here in town, and we were enjoying a cup of coffee, and I looked at my phone rang, and my son, I could tell it was my son, so I chipperly answered the phone. I said, hello, son, how are you? And all I could hear on the other end of the phone through sobs were just inaudible sounds, and a word or two I heard, Addie fell, concussion, can't see. You know, all of a sudden, all the chatter and Buena Vista roastery just went away. Whatever subject Lynette and I were discussing now was moot. Everything got real quiet. We focused. And the only words that came to Lynette, to Joe, and to Cole were, oh God, help her. Oh God, help her. Oh God, help her. In times of desperation, you know, sometimes it just gets reduced down to those kinds of monosyllable words because we're so desperate. We, we need something outside ourselves to come to our aid. I'm so grateful that I can tell you she's seven years old now, she's fully recovered, and she's as precocious as she's ever been, and she no longer wants to marry me. So that awkward thing is over, a sweet thing. Jesus wants us to be able to come to him in times of absolute crisis like that. But Jesus is also teaching here that there needs to be something else about your prayer life other than a panic button prayer. Panic button prayers are so important and so necessary. But there better be more in your portfolio than panic button prayers. And so he's talking about that in this passage. And so I want to talk to you this morning and talk about how do we do this. And we're just going to walk through this. Um, by the way, did you hear about the old man who said that someone was complaining about how they took public prayer out of schools and the old man said, I'm not worried about that. As long as there are tests in schools, there'll be prayer in schools. <laughs> because when you reach the end of your rope, you reach out to God. Jesus is saying there's more to life than that kind of prayer life. That's important, but there needs to be a little bit more. So let me just walk you through this passage a little bit. Nobody ever believed in the power of prayer more than Jesus of Nazareth. Nobody. And he gives us this instruction. He says in verse 5 that we should pray authentically. Pray what's really happening in your heart. He says in verse 5, Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, that's all they're going to get. That's my paraphrase. Bring the real you before the real God, because the real you is all God really is interested in. I found this quote by Michael Novak. I love it. He says, belief and prayer are inextricable. To come to recognize God is to become aware of standing in a conscious presence. To come to believe is to begin to pray. To come to believe because of the nature of the constancy of God's presence. When we start to really trust God, we are aware of his presence. Now, I want to talk to you about that in three ways. By the way, I have a little message here from our folks that were here uh, from Blue Valley. You can't read it from there, but it says, We love MHBC, Blue Valley Baptist, Kansas City, thanks, 2018. I wanted you to see that. So they left us a little love note. But when you think about how you communicate with a person... There's about three ways to do it. First, I'm going to talk to the person. All right. This is direct communication. So when I'm talking to a person, I often am a little bit guarded about what I say. I'm very aware that they're listening to my words, especially if I've never met them before or don't know them very well. And so I'm talking directly to him and I'm going to be nice for a while. I'll be nice. I'll be courteous. I'll be kind. 
but I'm talking to a person. Then there is a second way, and in the second way, I'm going to talk in front of a person. So, this is when I know I'm talking to you, but I'm very aware that your grandmother is sitting beside you. And so what I say to you, I'm going to be very careful because I don't want to come off too snarky in front of your grandmother. So I'm very aware that your grandmother is listening in on our conversation. I am talking in front of her. Does that make sense? So it kind of filters out and guards my conversation. Even though I'm talking to you, I'm super aware that grandma's sitting right there. And then there's a third way. And the third way is we talk to a person in absence. I don't know if that's even how you spell it, but that's what I'm saying. Absence. And that's when you and I are having a conversation down at the roastery. She's not there, so we can talk freely about anything, not in her presence. Okay? Now, when you talk about God, there's a sense in which there are times when we talk to him. And if you've listened to church prayers, you're very aware that some people are very careful in how they talk to God. Their, their language takes on a certain kind of tone to it. And if they pray in church, they may be talking to God, but they're very aware that you're listening in. And so they, sometimes their voice drops down and gets real smooth. And they use words they would never use any other time. They're talking to God, but they're very aware that they're talking in front of a crowd, right? And then there are times when I talk about God and I imagine him not hearing me at all. This is usually when I say bad words. <laughs> or you say bad words. I don't do that, but I've heard. This is usually when we gossip. God's absent. God's someplace else. This is when we gossip or when we're critical or we say negative things. Because God's absent. We're careful, a little less careful. Now we're just as true as we can possibly be because God's on another assignment. Now, often in situation number one, I hide my real heart. I filter what I say. And this is what happens lots of times in, for instance, a job interview. Have you ever been in a job interview and one of the times they'll, one of the questions they often ask you is, what is your greatest weakness? Have you ever heard that? You know what the number one answer is? I work too hard. Give me a break, really. You're not going to tell the truth in that situation. You're not going to say, you know what, sometimes I just like to stare out the window and maybe play solitaire on the computer, but that's the weakness I have and I, I can spend hours doing that. No one says that at a job interview, right? We're guarded about that. But that's the way we are. We have this guarded speech sometimes. We filter what we're going to say. But when I filter what I'm going to say, and I'm always having to guard what I say, I long to be someplace where I can just be real, where I can just let my hair down, where I can just tell it like it is. The psalmist reminds us about that. He says we all want to do that. Because really, we are never in this scenario with God. We are never in, God is never absent. Look at what it says. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I am never in a place that God is really absent from my conversations. But sometimes it feels like he is. And because sometimes it feels like he's in another universe, that's when I sin. <laughs> that's when I speak words that are unwholesome. That's when I have thoughts that are not holy thoughts because God is distant from me. But one of the things Jesus is teaching us here is this, that the goal of prayer, the goal of prayer is to live all of my life and to speak all of my words in the joyful presence of God. That every word that comes from my mouth is in the presence of the God 
of the universe. And when you read the New Testament, you see that's exactly how Jesus lived his life. There were many times in Jesus' ministry when he would be about to heal someone. (laughs) And he sometimes would talk to the person that he's about to heal. Sometimes he would talk to the crowd that is gathered around about the person he's about to heal and the healing that's going to. And sometimes he wouldn't talk to the crowd or to the person. He talked to God. It was as if wherever Jesus spoke, he was speaking and he knew that his words were in the presence of his father. Do you remember that time in John chapter 11 where Jesus had heard that his good friend Lazarus had died and he been dead a couple of days and he comes back and he stands in front of the tomb and there's a crowd gathered around. There's this amazing prayer. I want you to see it. In John chapter 11, it says in verse 41, and Jesus looked upward, by the way, he did not bow his head. He did not close his eyes. So if you see someone with their heads up and eyes open, that's just kind of how Jesus did it. Okay. So he looked upward and he said, father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. Huh. When Jesus prays, whenever he speaks, whatever words fell from his lips, whoever he was talking to, he was very aware that God was present. So that even his everyday conversation were prayers. See, for Jesus, the line between praying and just speaking was a very thin veil. He was always with his father. And that meant that often, even though he was alone, he was never lonely. It's such a contrast to you and I. Because in our world, we're so often lonely, but very rarely are we alone. So pray authentically. He also wants us to pray privately. Look at verse 6 in your Bible, please. Whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus is not talking about going into a bedroom. Um, Most of the people listening to Jesus preach this sermon on this mountainside were very poor people. And poor people in Palestine did not have houses with many rooms. In fact, most of them had houses with one room. One. They may have a little closet type room where they would keep some tools that would, they would bring in at night and maybe some animals that they would have. And that might have a door on it. So it was a humble room. It was a mop closet. It was a place where you kept, you know, the Johnny brush. That was a place where the, the, the chickens kind of rested and roosted. Jesus said, when you pray, go in there. Close the door. Go into the humble room in a humble house. I don't know what that tells you about God, but God does not need a cathedral for us to talk to him. He's perfectly willing to share the space with chickens. He's perfectly willing to share the space with a mop because wherever he goes, it suddenly becomes a sacred place. Do you have a place like that? A place where you go and get alone with God. I have two places. I'll tell you about. One is there's a chair that I sit in. If you've ever been to my house, um, there's a chair next to a window. There's some bookshelves there. And there in that chair, I have easy access to about five different Bibles with five different versions, journals, a few little commentaries. And of course, coffee is within arm's reach early in the morning. And I rise pretty early and often I'm down there by myself until my wife arrives, you know, comes down and And so there's often about an hour and a half to two hours. It's just me and the Bible and a journal. And I'll have some music on, you know, some out of Africa theme score music, you know, something in the background. But I sit there and I listen to the Lord. I read the Psalms. 
He talks to me. I write down things in my journal. And that place has become a sacred place. It's my, there's no door on it, but there's a place that just he and I kind of communicate. That's my room. Do you have a place like that? Where every day, not when there's a panic, but every day, you're just wanting to hear from your father. But I have another room, and it's larger. It's outside. Um, I have a lot of land out where we live, a Bureau of Land Management land, and I go on these walks I call Ambulatio Divina, which is Latin for divine sacred walk, and I take my two prayer partners with me. Uh, one of them's name is Dexter Doofus, and the other one is Bella Badbreath. She used to be Bella the Wonder Dog, but I've changed her name. The older she gets, the worse her breath is. But we go for these walks, and now you think, oh, you just like to hike, and so that's, you're not real. Listen, this is what I have dedicated my time to as your pastor. When I go for these walks, I've asked God, I say, Lord, bring to my mind's eye the people in my world that need to be held in my heart in your presence. And there's been many occasions when I've been walking in those woods or out in the open, and Bob Seberger, when he had his accident and had all those broken ribs, his face came to mind, and I just lifted him up for the Lord. There are many times last year when Cleo passed, I thought of you, and I think of you often, and your face comes to mind. And when I see the faces of the people that I love, I just lift them up to the Lord as I walk in those woods. That's a sacred space for me. So if I am out in the woods, it's not recreational, although it's fun. It's also very spiritual. Do you have a place like that? Do you have some sort of rhythm to your life like that? That's what Jesus is saying. Go to that secret place where you and the Father can communicate. I don't know. Do you remember the structure of the Old Testament? Do you know how the temple structure was? Uh, structure of the Old Testament. Structure of the Old Testament temple. All right. There were three basic areas, and I, I don't remember where I got this idea, so I can't take credit for the originality of it. But if you remember the structure of the temple, what was, the, what was that basic structure like? There was what? Anybody remember? All right, there's an outer courtyard, okay? All right, now in the outer courtyard of the Old Testament temple, who could go there? Anybody. Anybody can go there. Gentiles can go there. Um, it didn't matter who, you could go into the outer courtyard. And this author um, says, we all have an outer courtyard. All of us do. We bring it to church. So what you're experiencing in here today, this is your outer courtyard. You're aware of what you're wearing. You're very aware of how you talk. You're how, how nice you are to people. But when you go to work, that's your outer courtyard. There are people that you, and really you sometimes cannot control who goes into your outer courtyard. See, everybody's welcome there just about. Whether you want them to come in there or not, they're sometimes there. But there's a second chamber. What was it called? Do you remember? Clearly, we need to do some work in the Old Testament. In the, in, the, in, the, in the temple, there was a second chamber, and it was called the holy place. Okay, who could go there? See, not everybody can go in there. Not everybody can go into the holy place. You, were, you had to have, meet certain kind of criteria to go into the holy place. And you have a holy place. You have people that, and you, by the way, are in complete control of who has access to your holy place. There are some people you allow in. You'll have family members that will go in. You may have some friends. There may be someone in your Sunday school class. There may be a few people in your world. But you are in control of who comes into the holy place. And this is the people that get close to your heart. Where you can kind of be honest and you can be real. And you can kind of tell it like it is a little bit. You have a holy place. Everybody's got one. But then there was another place in the Old Testament temple. Do you remember what it was called? Ah, uh, Holy of Holies. Who goes there? All right. Just God and the high priest. You've got one. You have a holy of holies. And what that means is, 
No one can go in that place but God and you. Just you and God. And there are things in the holy of holies about you that you may not even be aware of about you. And there may be people in this room here that look at you and have no idea what's going on in the Holy of Holies. Because that's the place only the Father and you commune. And they can look on the outside and look at you and go, you look like you got it together. It looks like you know what you're doing. Your life management skills are okay. But they cannot see inside of here. Only God knows what's going on in the Holy of holies. There are depths about you that you may not even be aware that are true about you. Even if you wanted to know them, you may not be able to grasp them until the Lord reveals them to you. This is why the psalmist sometimes would even talk about their souls in the third person, because this is really, this is your soul. If you remember, the psalmist sometimes would say, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Speaking about it in the third person. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? What's going on? What's going on, soul? And then that verse in verse 7, it says, And deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. So this is the deep of me and the deep of God. This is where this happens, in the secret place, in the Holy of Holies. We all have that. It's filled sometimes, this place, with joy and love and shalom and rest. It's filled with these wonderful things, but sometimes it's filled with Anxiety and it's filled with despair and it's dry and it's withered and it's empty. And only you know that. Well, you and God. Jesus says he wants to reside here. No one knows about the Holy of Holies inside you but you and God. So this week I'm going to challenge you to find a place where you could go every day, where you could just be honest with God. As I've told you before, C.S. Lewis says, pray what's in your heart, not what ought to be in your heart. Pray that, talk to him there. It might be easy, it might be hard, it may feel like a waste of time, but this is where it happens, holy of holies. Your father hears you there. Then Jesus goes on to say there's some things that you could actually talk to him about. In fact, if we were to read the rest of this passage in Matthew 6, you'll see the model prayer. We're going to save that for next week. But Jesus then says there's things to pray about like give us this day. Give us this day. Thank you for this day, Lord. And then what does he say? Give us this day, our daily bread. It's okay to ask God for bread. It's okay to ask God. He says, and lead us not in temptation. Lord, I'm having a struggle here in this particular area. Help me, Lord. It's okay to talk to God about those day-to-day -day things. So pray concretely in those areas. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 4, where he says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He says, in everything. What does that mean? Pretty much everything and everything. We are to bring that into this holy of holies and talk to God about it and bring it to him and commune with him there. Do you have a deep passion and desire for financial security? Talk to him about it. Do you have a deep desire for a life-giving friend? Talk to him about it. People say, well, that sound, God will think I'm selfish. <laughs> like God doesn't know. The quickest way to kill prayer in your life is to pretend to care about something you do not care about. 
So I start with what I want. And I pray that. And there's no secret technique. There's no formula. There's no amount of faith. If I just can generate enough faith, that maybe God will give me. If I beg him, if I plead, that's not what it's about. God's not that kind of God. What God wants is a relationship with you. Right here. And then I think he wants us to pray with some humility. If you'll turn to chapter 7, verse 7 again, look at what it says. He says, ask, and it'll be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. You know, when I read that, um, I struggled with it a lot this week. But here's what I've kind of come to. That's the language of a beggar. That's the language of a homeless person. That's the language of someone who has a cardboard sign. I can't do this. I I need something. And so they seek. They go door to door. They knock. You have anything? Can you spare a dime? Can you help me out? And honestly, I think this is why I resist prayer as much as I do, and maybe you do. Can I just, can I be honest with you for a second? Not like I've been dishonest any time before now, but can I just bring it down to a real level? The generation that I'm kind of talking to today is a very self-sufficient generation. You know? You can do it yourself. I hear it all the time. I find out what you've done around your house, you know? I said, why didn't you ask for some help? I got this. I don't want to bother you. We don't like to ask for help. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's the way we were raised. I'm that way. It's very hard for me to ask for help. It's hard for me to admit that I don't have what it takes to get something done, physically or spiritually. And this is why this is important to me, because prayer is the language of a beggar. Prayer is the language of a homeless person. Prayer is something that needy people do. And I don't like to think of myself that way. And I'm looking into the eyes of some people that don't like to think of themselves that way either. I'm a self-made man. I'm self-sufficient. I've been called to be a husband first, a father, and a pastor. (laughs) And I can't tell you how badly I mess up those callings when I do them on my own, and I do that a lot. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not connected enough. I am woefully inadequate to fulfill my calling. And whenever I forget that, Whenever I try to do what I am called to do without complete and total dependence upon the Father who lives in the secret place of my soul, I fail miserably, and I pay the price for it, and so does everybody in my world. I need to come to terms with the fact that I'm an asker. I'm a beggar. Hezekiah, I don't know if you know this story. There's an Old Testament story about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king of Israel, and and, um, he got a letter in the mail. Well, it wasn't in the mail, but it was a messenger brought a letter. And in this letter, the king of Assyria said, I'm coming to wipe you out. You don't even need to put up any resistance. I have more men than you do. I have better armament than you do. You're going to get wiped off the face of the earth. You might as well give in. If you will capitulate to my invasion, you can remain a king of sorts, but you can't worship Yahweh anymore, but I'm going to take over. Just get ready. You can stay king if you want, kind of a puppet king, but here I come. Hezekiah says, has this beautiful prayer. I found 
In Isaiah 37, it says, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and he read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord. He went to the temple. He went to the house of the Lord and he spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. O Lord our God, save us from his hand so that all of the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Took the letter, laid it on the altar, said, I, I, I give it to you. I can't fix this. I give it to you. Do you know what the history is? God delivered them. God took care of it. It's a beautiful story. I gave you a piece of paper when you came in. It's in your worship folder. It says, Dear God, I want you to think about what you might put on that bill. You know, maybe a stack of bills. You just don't know where the money's going to come from. What would you put on your piece of paper? It might be something financial. It might be a relationship that has gone sour. That used to be close and now is not. And you don't know what to do about it. It may be a child or a grandchild that's run away from God. It may be divorce papers. It may be a death certificate. Or it might be news from a doctor. I'm going to ask you to put it on there in a minute. Spread it out before the Lord and read it to him. And pray the Hezekiah prayer. Oh God, I can't fix it. I cannot fix it. You see, that's what sometimes drives us to God. And it's good that it does. Show of hands on this one. How many of you right now have a person in your life that you would like to fix? Come on now, don't, you're in church, don't lie. Everybody. Somebody you'd like to fix. A friend was telling me that there's a, uh, I'd never known this before. There's a summer camp for dogs. Did you know that? You can go on vacation and you can drop your dog off. It's kind of a refresher course on obedience school to retrain dogs, to make sure that he's given the retraining so that every time he gets a command, his response is prompt and eager and wholehearted and unquestioning obedience. He comes home and it's like he's a new dog. Summer camp for dogs. I told this to Lynette, and she said, I wish there was a summer camp for husbands. <laughs> we love to fix people. God loves you, Rich, and I have a wonderful plan for your life. We love to fix people. But as much as you love the people you want to fix, your children, your grandchildren, a parent, a friend, or whoever, it's a real good thing that you can't fix them. Because the place that needs fixing, the place where fixing actually occurs, is right here. And if you could have access to this holy of holies, then you'd be on par with whom? God. You don't belong here. You can't go here. And this is where change occurs. It's a good thing that I can't fix you and you can't fix me. And I promise you I'm going to do my best to stop trying to fix you. And I promise you I'm going to do my best to keep you from trying to fix me. We are not fixers of other people. But we can pray. Between me and the deepest part of another person is Jesus. The direct line between me and the person that I want to fix is not a face-to-face -face conversation. The more direct line is a prayer to the God that resides right inside there. And when I talk to the God right inside there about them, the possibility of change actually can occur. Life in the kingdom 
runs on prayer. Love God. Love people. Serve the world. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. He wants to answer that prayer. So I pray for the God that resides inside you here. He also tells us to pray boldly. He says, if you then who are evil, verse 11, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who love him? We give gifts. Last week was my daughter-in-law Mindy's birthday or two weeks ago, and we stopped someplace and got a gift and dropped it by their house and gave her a hug. We like, that's just what we do. We love to give good gifts. Do you know who else loves to give gifts? The God who thought you up. He wants to give good gifts to you. One of my sons called me a few weeks ago, and we started talking about what they were doing. Books he was reading, the projects he was working on, stuff that was happening in his world. It was a wonderful kind of how's the weather kind of chat, you know. At the end, which is so unusual because my, my sons don't do this very often. He just, in an unguarded moment, as he hung up, he said, I love you, Dad. And then click. And I went, what? And I played that back in my mental mind. A minute. I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. <laughs> you know what that did to my father's heart? You do know what it did to your father's, my father's heart. You know what Jesus is saying in this teaching? He says, you take that feeling you had when your son said, I love you, Dad, and you multiply that by the billions of Christ followers who've come to meet and commune with him in the Holy of Holies, and you get just an inkling of the sense of how much God loves you and wants to give good gifts to you. So what's the biggest burden on your heart? What melts you? What causes you to lose sleep? What causes you to stagger under the load? What is that for you? That piece of paper that I gave you says, Dear God, I want you to use that like Hezekiah used it and write out maybe a word, maybe a phrase, maybe a symbol, something. Keep it guarded so no one can see it. But I want you to write that out. It might be your health. It might be a person, a child, a grandchild, a friend. It might be a marriage. It might be a betrayal. It might be guilt. It might be loneliness. It might be abuse. It might be an addiction. I'd like you to use that to kinesthetically get involved with this idea that you can bring anything to God. What do you need to tell God about? Where do you need his help? What is that deepest thing on your heart? Dear God, fix this. I can't. Lord, we love you so much. I pray right now, God, that you would take these letters that your servants are going to give to you. We release them because we know that we are just beggars. We're askers. We can't fix. But you can. Would you? And if you choose not to, would you fix my heart to be okay with that? So 
as you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe open your eyes just enough so that you can write on that piece of paper. And then fold it. Put it back in your Bible. And take it to your sacred place this week. And pray the Hezekiah prayer. And don't give up. Don't quit. Ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Search and keep on searching. And you'll find God there. 